There we go. Good morning. Um, afternoon yet? Almost. We're getting there. Um, you can hear me okay. I usually am walking all over the stage, so um, if, if I kind of start looking a little um, antsy here because I'm kind of having to do this, um, just throw something at me, calm me down. Um, I'm going to um, reiterate, kind of reintroduce, um, reinforce much of what you've heard today, but from a different perspective, hopefully. Um, it's just really a different lens to look through what we call inflammation. And um, you will be tested on this slide, so make sure you get it. And I should qualify, um, um, clarify, um, the slides that you might have in your presentations will be different than what I'm showing. I, I had like 70 some odd slides for this presentation. I realized I have 45 minutes and I would be talking like this the whole time and, and I wouldn't get through all that information and you would be totally in neuronal overload. So I, I, I edited the slides and Sarah will repost them when we're done. So um, just follow along with your ears and your eyes. Um, don't look at the, uh, the PDF thingy. But th this slide actually um, summarizes much of what you've heard this morning and what I will um, target uh, in this little talk for you. And that is that there are things that cause, cause inflammation. We're, we're going to define that in greater detail in a moment. But when um, it affects you and your patients continually on a repetitive basis, all systems will start to break down. But that's mostly um, when it becomes chronic. And, and what this study shows or suggests is that when inflammation becomes chronic, that's when we run into problems. And so we're going to talk a lot about what, first, what is this inflammation we're speaking to? and then what are the causes of it, and then um, how it affects our neural endocrine system. So when we think about inflammation, first off, let's remember it is a normal, healthy, desirable process in our body. We want to have an inflamed response. So what inflammation really is, simply, is your immune system protecting you. It's your immune system responding to some insult into your systems that is supposed to heal your tissues and protect you. And it does it through a number of different, as John was saying, nine different steps in this cascade of immune stimulation. Along the way, we have these different um, cardinal signs of inflammation. They are swelling and heat and um, pain and loss of function. So that is the inflammatory response. You want it when you're infected. You want it when you have a laceration. You want it when you have a broken bone. You don't want it chronically, though. And so, so we have both acute and a chronic inflammatory response. And acute is, is you know, an innate response primarily. And it's um, an acute stimulus. And it's a, it's a resolvable process. This is something that you want to experience. When the inflammatory process does not turn off, then we start to recruit the lymphocytes, the B and the T lymphocytes in your adaptive immunity. And because they're making antibodies and cytokines continually, then you're staying stuck up in this chronic, chronic, chronic state. And you could easily say that all the chronic degenerative conditions in your UC in practice are a result of chronic inflammation. But what you have here is a slide that demonstrates this, the causes of chronic inflammation. And this is basically everything we do in life, from environmental toxicants to microbial infections to how we eat, what we eat, how much we eat, to the cosmetics we use, to the relations we have. So, so potentially, Everything that we involve ourselves with in our life can be a source, if you will, of an inflammatory or healing process, right? So even eating an overabundance of organic foods could put a burden of oxidative stress on your systems that leads to chronic inflammation. So, so 
we have to keep this in mind when we're evaluating what we're talking about with chronic degenerative diseases and chronic inflammation. What is the source? I'm a, I'm a kind of a concept and kind of dot connecting person, doctor. I always want to ask the question, why? Why is someone unwell? And then drilling down. Why does someone come into your office if you're doing structural care? Why do they always need adjustment? Right? If the tissue's inflamed that holds a joint, a you know, vertebral motor unit intact, if the, the soft tissue, the fascial planes, the ligament, tendinous, muscular uh, tissue is chronically inflamed and, and toxic from uh, hypoxia, it's possible that that would cause some kind of spinal misalignment, yeah? Um, so, so you have a, a lot of different causes of chronic inflammation, and then chronic inflammation, here, um, Dr. Kearns showed you part of this slide, but I went in a little bit more detail in terms of the kinds of conditions that are related to chronic inflammation. Whoa! Everything we see in practice, yes? So, where do you begin with this? How do you begin? How do you, and it's like, well, <clears throat> it's daunting. And by the way, um, the, the, uh, the boxes here with the stars indicate uh, areas where there might be a neuroinflammatory um, response, something to do with the nervous system, whether it's peripheral or central and or specific, uh, condition specific. And so here's a, a different way of assessing that last si slide, is where we have an inflammatory process leading to chronic inflammation, leading to a whole plethora of different uh, conditions, and the ones in red, of course, are um, known to be what we would call neuroinflammatory. In truth, we really don't need to make a distinction. So, so I, though I'm standing up here lecturing about neuroinflammation, the truth is the same concepts that I will share with you about looking at neuroinflammation are applicable to the chronic inflammatory process, whether it's type 2 diabetes, whether it's an arthritic change, whether it's um, polycystic, it doesn't matter. The concepts are the same. Um, it's just expressing in different parts of the body, often in multi multiple dimensions or multiple systems. Um, yeah. So, so what is neuroinflammation? That's simple. It's, it's, um, it's the immune system working to protect the nervous system, and specifically, uh, we typically are thinking of the central nervous system, not so much the peripheral. So it's a healing process, just like it is in any other tissue. But there's some interesting things about the nervous system and the uh, immune system. It's a very complex crosstalk interrelation that's always going on no matter what. You'll learn one of the things that I hope to establish is that there's a very intimate and kind of parallel relation between your immune cells and your nervous system cells. And so, so the, the, you, let us not forget, too, that there's um, the autonomic nervous system, right? The parasympathetic, sympathetic, and this, as chiropractors, we spend a lot of time focusing on that. But we forget about the enteric nervous system, which is that part that is very specific, if you recall, to the gastrointestinal tract, right? So it has, in a sense, a very special relation with the central nervous system. So there's this constant crosstalk between the enteric nervous system and our brain. So what's interesting, it, too, for me um, is that neurotransmitters are secreted by nerve cells and that there are cytokines secreted by um, nerves. Ner cytokines are, um, how, how, I got that backwards, receptors of the neurotransmitters such as uh, histamine and serotonin are found on mast cells. What that's saying is that, that the immune cells, which are typically thought of as just neuroprotective, uh, um, also are involved with neurotransmitters. And that immune cells also synthesize neurotransmitters, like dopamine, GABA, serotonin. So that's an intimate relation, in other words, um, part of the chemistry of your neurons are found 
functioning in your immune cells. Um, the other component of this that is interesting is that there's, um, there's um, a lot of sensory interrelation between immune cells activation and nerve cell activation. And the best of those that you know of is nociceptors pain, right? So that when there's an increased inflammatory response, that pain or the nociceptors are stimulated by the immune cells. So immune cells triggering pain. So when you think of the opioid uh, epidemic or chronic pain epidemic is really what it's about. People don't want to be in pain. Reducing chronic inflammation really should be at the foundation of our therapeutic approach, right? Hopefully. <clears throat> so there's a lot of similarities between these two systems that is summarized on this slide. Though. So they're protective, they do surveillance, and they're um, both variable and heterogeneous. They stimulate and store memory. They both use synapses. They both secrete these little um, communicating um, uh, chemicals, cytokines, and neurochemicals. So there's a lot of similarities. And, and I like to think of um, the immune cells and the nerve cells, or our senses, is kind of like how we communicate with our universe. Think of it this way. So you have your, all your five senses, right? And, and I like this paper in particular because um, Kipnis was talking also about body posture and our soma and how it relates to taking in out this, all this outside stimuli. So you could think of the, the senses as that part that is really looking at the outer component of our environment, where the immune cells, as represented in that lower right corner, are really sensing the internals um, environments of our existence. So, so both of them are taking sensory perception pictures um, of your environments, one's kind of external, one's kind of internal, and they have to have this relation of communication. And uh, um, you know, you see it in your practice when you're working on someone um, from a structural point of view. You're influencing both systems intimately with um, the kind of chiropractic work you do. So what are we talking about with um, our immune cell players? They are um, tumor necrosis factor, interferons, complement proteins, NF-kappa B, interleukins, uh, the innate and the adaptive immune cells. Now, so, so the innate and adaptive immune cells you might get, um, some of these other players you might have heard of but not have a real good sense of what, how important they are or what they're doing. So it, it's um, not that you need necessarily to remember this, but, but for me as a clinician like yourselves, uh, being in your seat, it's good to know what they're doing and what modulates them and what you're doing with phytonutrients um, and nutrients and therapeutics. So NF, uh, not a, um, tumor necrosis factor and interferons are kind of like the scouts, the first line sensory markers that indicate or communicate to your um, immune cells that there's danger. They're in all cells of your body, in the, embedded in the membranes, and their job is, is once they sense some kind of pathogenic or insult in your body, boom, they activate the release from the cells, and they go and stimulate the B and T lymphocytes into activity. So both of them, though the, the uh, tumor uh, interferon is more uh, viral related, uh, the tumor necrosis factor is um, is more general located. So they're like the first line responders, the scouts that let your, uh, that wake your immune system up. The complement proteins are fascinating. And I, you know, I just love the concept of innate immunity and complement proteins. Complement proteins are primary, they're floating all over the body, but they're really prevalent in the gut. And their job is to kind of like blindly sense aberrant patterns, molecular patterns on things coming down the pipe, your gut, 
through your esophagus into your intestine. So imagine you eat a, a, some molecule of some kind of warped, distorted gluten, and it and your 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 your, your complement proteins actually have this what are called pattern recognition sensors, and and they actually like it's like braille. They're kind of feeling these patterns of proteins on the outer surfaces of bugs and proteins and go, whoa, 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 that one I don't recognize. And they activate, divide in half, kind of, and then stimulate your immune cells, your innate immune cells. It's a fascinating process, and we're born with that. So when we talk about innate intelligence, it's way beyond our comprehension. How is it that our innate cells know that that's like, like a virus isn't good for us? I, it's just mind-boggling to me. It's a beautiful thing. It's miraculous about our health and bodies. And so, um, so that's what compliments are. Um, tumor uh, NF kappa B is is a bad boy. He sits kind of quietly down on the inside of your cells. It's a, it's kind of on the nuclear envelope, and it's a major regulator of immunological inflammatory response. And if NF kappa B gets activated by tumor necrosis factor, say for instance, it literally turns the DNA mechanism on inside your cell to start making all these inflammatory interleukins and cytokines that keep your body in this upregulated place. So NF-kappa B is very important, but it is, uh, when it gets stuck in an on position, it, is, uh, it's, it raises hell. Um, on you because it it's one of those major instigators of chronic inflammation. So if there was um, a pharmaceutical that could turn off NF-kappa B, it would be one of those multi-billion dollars blockbusters. And guess what, gang? You have something in your armamentarium that works at turning off NF-kappa B. And we'll go through that in case studies later on um, this afternoon. So I won't, I think you, you got a sense of interleukins, they're, they're kind of specific um, cytokines. And if I stay up here and keep talking like this, you're not gonna get lunch till two o'clock, so I gotta um, keep moving. These are, this is just a slide of the players that I just spoke about, kind of like, and this is my favorite <clears throat> innate immune cell, it's a dendrite. And this guy is something out of Star Wars. I mean, it is just so beautiful. It's primarily going to be found in and around the gut and the malt, around your gut associated, mucosal associated. And those little tentacles coming out from its made body are literally, literally like periscopes that can reach up in between cells and kind of sense you know, what the environment is in your gut. And then if it senses something that isn't quite right, kind of like the complement proteins, then it, then it activates um, the macrophages and neutrophils. This is also known as a, at times as an antigen-presenting cell. So the dendrites can literally pick up aberrant proteins and bugs and present them to your B and T lymphocytes and say, hey, look at this. We don't like this. Build an, an adaptive response to it. So that's the dendrite. So the common causes of of neuroinflammation. It's, as I was saying earlier, it's everything we are and do, pretty much, right? Um, it's like, wow. But, but if you recall, I had that slide up, and this is a little, it gets a little bit, this is just the same slide you saw a little while ago. I put it in here again to remind you of what you know, causes chronic inflammation. You might add some things to this as well. Right, so you know, uh, nutrient deficiency. Uh, no, I'll get going there. Um, so here's an example of what happens when we have, say, one imbalance in, in, in a particular system. So this cascade is speaking to uh, um, some kind of mucosal immune abnormality. Say you have an aberrant protein ingestion of a beta casein and your immune cells don't like beta casein. Where do you find beta casein, by the way? Milk. So it's primarily the dairy protein that is antigenic. So say you, you eat beta casein, you didn't know that your immune cells don't like it, and it leads to um, kind of an intolerance, in, immunologically speaking, that then creates a, because of the inflammation sti stimulated by the immune reaction to this protein, that begins to alter 
your microbiome, leading to a condition called dysbiosis as opposed to symbiosis of the microbiome in your gut. When that occurs, you can, it can create a inflammatory response, again, a, a detailed immune response, that then affects the lining of the gut. So when the lining of the gut is inflamed, what's the other word for that we kind of attribute to that? Thank you, leaky gut, or intestinal, I, saw, I was reading your lips. So intestinal permeability, right? And when you have intestinal permeability, you're allowing food molecules or undigested proteins or microbial um, proteins to enter into the lymph system called the gut-associated lymphatic system right below the epithelial cells that then creates this big onslaught um, of toxic burden, if you will, to the immune system kind of sitting under the, the epithelium because it's leaking, now you're pouring all this crap into your immune, your lymph cells, which triggers an, a, a continual immune response. And when that continued immune response keeps going and going and going and going, you're going to start to affect all systems of the body. In this particular cascade, it's uh, reflecting how uh, you can get systemic inflammation, potential autoimmunity, then neurodegeneration, neuroinflammation, and eventually cognitive decline and, and failure in things like neural degeneration, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's. And that's just one cascade. This, and this one in particular relates to uh, neurology, but it could be an endocrine th thing like Hashimoto's. It could be an arthritic thing like uh, rheumatoid. So it doesn't, you know, you can use the same principle and go right on down and plug in different tissue types. But that is just one source of a chronic inflammatory process, and that is through oral intolerance or a food. But if you remember, we had all those other causes. And, and this, is, this is, you know, I highlighted this um, because it's so critical. So, so, and you don't have to read it, I'll just tell you what it says. It's, it, what it's saying is the microbiome is developmentally affecting the formation of your central nervous system, literally helping it form and replicate, duplicate, and heal. And conversely, the central nervous system is having a direct effect on the microbiome. So there's this in intimate, intimate interrelation. It's not just a casual thing, it's intimate. Uh, Alicia Fuzano said that that the, the health of your, your microbiome at age three will dictate your health for the rest of your life, and you can't change it. Wow. You can alter it, but you're not going to change it. So you're kind of pre we're predestined at age three. So, so a, a vaginal birth delivery by an unstressed mother who's feeding their infant colostrum and then breastfeeding for a year, that's ideal. Right, without any antibiotic therapies. <clears throat> These are players, and this is actually taken from that same paper. Um, I won't beat this one, it's, it's, but it's really reflecting how different components of the gut are leading to different types of um, uh, influences, especially uh, um, in our central nervous system. Same uh, concept, different slides, showing this intimate interrelation between the gut and the brain. But it's not just the microbiome that you see on the left, it's also the peripheral nervous system as well. So, so when you start to think about what you might be influencing when you're doing structural integration work, it's what I call chiropractic, um, it's, um, it has a profound effect on both peripheral and central nervous system, which then can affect the gut as well. So what about bowel issues, you know, IBS? So this is a paper that simply says, wow, when your gut is chronically inflamed, your brain is going to be potentially chronically inflamed and may lead to systemic inflammation. It's just another way of saying what I've just been saying for the past 10 minutes or so, that when you have known inflammatory gut problems like irritable bowel syndrome, 
it's going to potentially lead to systemic inflammation and of the nervous system as well. And again, this is a, 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 a I like cascades and cartoons. It makes learning easier for me when you can look at um, a picture rather than read words, um, but that's me. So this is, again, just a, an example of, of how um, irritable bowel can cascade down through. Um, how many of you um, kind of uh, are aware of lipopolysaccharides? Yeah. Yeah, a little bit. So lipopolysaccharides, are, you'll hear about them. They're AC, AKA, um, also known as endotoxin. It's just a, a particular, it's, a, it's actually um, a gram-negative bacterium's attachment protein on the epithelial lining. So you have these gram-negatives that don't respond to most of the routine um, antibiotics that kind of embed on the epithelial lining of your intestine, and they have this attachment protein called lipopolysaccharide. It's extremely toxic to us. The problem is when it's embedded on the lining of the intestines, um, it creates an irritation, hence inflammation of the intestine, leading to increased permeability. A big, big bummer. So um, uh, this is something that you might want to be aware of in the future when you get more involved in looking at some of this from a nutritional testing place. Um, and we know that there's a, there's a real strong correlation between um, intestinal microbiome um, imbalance and autism and Alzheimer's. There's a, an innumerable studies that are directly linking cognitive decline, neural degeneration, and imbalances in the gut floor. Why am I emphasizing this one? I mean, the gut, because it is a primary mover in systemic health for all of our patients. So um, when we start to really think about neuroinflammation, and, and, um, we, we must consider the gut as a primary. It's not the only, but it is a primary mover. So um, this is just another one of the studies. Um, and there's um, numerous studies, I, I, again, for sake of time and keeping you awake, um, I won't belabor these points, but I'm simply making a point. But uh, that particular study that I just ignored um, is really related to stress um, and oxidative stress and what happens when we, when we use the word stress. It's, it's kind of like stress and inflammation. We use these words and we don't define them. We need to define them. So what are we talking about? A stress response. Yeah. So I'll define it in a little bit for you, but I'm trying to define what inflammation is, right? It's a normal, healthy healing process that when it goes up into a chronic place, it's a problem. And so the kinds of conditions that we're speaking to are the chronically driven uh, inflammatory cascades. So, um, and we don't like that. So um, oxidative stress, well, we'll go into that in a second, but this one is about how the microglia, which are primarily the immune component, they comprise maybe 15% of our brain cells, the astrocytes, the good portion of the others, that the microglia have multiple roles in modulating all this trash that might be coming into your central nervous system. So they can protect it and help regeneration, but they can also stimulate all this inflammatory cascade as well. So this is fun for me because as a chiropractor, uh, um, thinking of nervous system as we were taught, we kind of forget, well, the sympathetic nervous system innervates immune tissues, like, like the lymph tissue, the bone tissues, like the thymus, like, okay, so there's, so there's immediate you know, peripheral nervous system relation with our immune system, and then the sympathetic and the adrenal medulla have an intimate relation too. So think fight or flight adrenaline and sympathetic nervous system. You know that relation real well. But we also know that the glucocorticoids, cortisol, um, um, endosterone, not endosterone, um, glucoaldosterone, have an influence also on immune cells. So, so what happens is both of these stress hormones, adrenaline, 
What's adrenaline called in the brain? Epinephrine. Okay? Epinephrine and adrenaline are exactly the same thing. It's just that when we're talking about the brain, we call it epinephrine, norepinephrine. When we call it from the adrenals, it's called adrenaline, noradrenaline. Same thing and same action. So, so, so what, this, uh, what I'm pointing to is that both adrenaline, epinephrine, and cortisol have an intimate activation on the immune system. Dr. Kearns mentioned that cortisol suppresses immunity over time. If you think of prednisone as a medication some of our patients are on, what is it? It's an immune suppressant, right? But what's interesting, in chronic stressors, cortisol can upregulate, downregulate, upregulate, downregulate immunological reactions, so inflammatory reactions can be um, affected. So if, if you learn nothing more from me, this slide might, and Dr. Kearns had this up as well. She had a, a slightly different version of it. Um, I'll speak to it slightly differently. But what, um, but what I'd like you to glean from this is that over here on the left upper, you see chronic stress, correct? All right, fill in the blank. What is the chronic stress? Okay, now this, this is taken from a paper about social isolation and psychological stressors, but it applies to any chronic stress that you are subject to, your patients are subject So fill in the blank there, and then what you see is the cortical releasing hormone stimulates the adrenaline from the adrenals. And you get all this adrenaline surging through your body, and then there's also stimulation of the um, a cortical, so you get a cortisol release too. And then down in the lower right side of the slide, you'll see where norepinephrine, epinephrine, glucocorticoids are stimulating what? That bad boy I mentioned a little while ago called NF-kappa B. NF-kappa B, remember I was saying that NF-kappa B is that nuclear transcription factor that's sitting down on the nuclear envelope in all your cells ready to trigger and stimulate all these inflammatory cytokines, and it's a response to stress. It could be oxidative stress, it could be environmental stress, it could be immunological stress, 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 doesn't matter. So, so then what happens is the NF-kappa B stimulates, you see, inflammation, but we're not, we're not telling on this slide what are those inflammatory markers. That's where your cytokines are. So prostaglandins, prostacyclines, interleukins, those are the inflammatory communicators that then cycle back up into the brain, creating the sense of inflammation. Now, if you look above the word inflammation in the brain, you'll see three things. Decreased monoamines, what are they? Those are your neuropeptides. Oh, you think you're going to feel good with serotonin when you're chronically inflamed? Uh-uh. What are you going to end up feeling? Depressed. You de <laughs> so, you get the, so your neurochemistry is going to be affected. And your tropic factors, so you, you decrease your central nervous system's ability to regenerate and reproduce. So your, your, your brain-derived neurotropic factor which is important for regeneration of brain cells, is, is suppressed. And then at the top, you see increased excitation, right? What is that? I'm going to show you the NMDA receptor in a moment, and, and you're going to just love it. But this, this increased excitation, by the way, is where your cannabinoids are working. They are a, um, a GABA enhancer through, well, no, not completely. The, they, they, they suppress that chronic inflammatory, chronic excitatory process, and I'll show you how in a second. So um, there's another paper about oxidative stress. Again, when you hear oxidative stress, but what we're talking about with oxidative stress, instead of it being external stuff, it's kind of internal stuff. Think of cell membrane damage, structure, function, relation. Chiropractors are structure, function, Practitioners, we work in a world of mechanotherapies, mechanotransduction. Oxidative stress is damaging to the membranes 
wherever in the body. So, <clears throat> so excess calorie intake, by the way, produces a, an incredible burden on your metabolic pathways that leads to oxidative stress. As an example, when you have all these free radicals produced by oxidative stress, what this paper is suggesting is that you're getting damage in your mitochondria membranes, your mitochondria DNA. Bummer, because what's going to happen? You ain't going to have no energy, because your mitochondria aren't working so well. So it's a big problem. And so when we have oxidative stress up here in the brain, it's inevitable that we're going to develop what? Neural degenerative condition. Ah, what are they? Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, dementia, mood disorders. And then we know that um, type 1 and 2 diabetes has a direct effect on the blood-brain barrier. And when that happens, all hell breaks loose in the brain in terms of inflammation. Um, uh, again, um, as you can tell, <laughs> I, can't, I will go down tangents, and, and I have to be careful not to. But this is, this is real important for me. Magnesium is one of my most favorite things in the world, um, not only as a mineral, but I just, the whole concept of magnesium. Um, I think humans have, and magne and humans are so intimately involved with magnesium, you have no idea. Think of it this way. So what is the center, center uh, molecule in plants that is so critically important for plants harnessing sunlight? What's that molecule called? Chlorophyll, okay, chlorophyll. And, and if I were to show you chlorophyll and, and um, hemoglobin, their molecular structure, are absolutely identical. What's the center ion in, in uh, hemoglobin? Iron, good. What's the center molecule in chlorophyll? Magnesium, yeah. And so you think there's not a relation there? There's an absolute intimate relation. What's it about? It's about harnessing light. It's about harnessing sunlight. Where do we get our energy? Where do we get our vitality? Where do your plants get it? From sunlight. It has to do it through chlorophyll. And so if you're not eating plants, get magnesium in, you ain't getting no energy either. That's a fun concept, huh? Yeah. So, so when you are thinking about organic vegetables and standard processed supplements, it's a lot deeper than you would ever imagine. And, and maybe during our breakout sessions this afternoon, um, get me to speak about, and you won't have to try, I will speak about about a, a deeper dive into why plant-based medicine is so, so important and why it's, yeah, it's the best. Anyway, this is about this receptor. This is that excitatory receptor. It's called a, a N-methyl-D-aspartic, NMDA receptor. It's, it's, um, it's a very necessary receptor when your cells need to die. That's a good thing. When your cells are expired and they're old and you don't need them, you want to activate this receptor. When, and you do that by switching out magnesium for calcium. So you see calcium outside the cell, and you see magnesium is kind of this ninja warrior block, like this. It's not going to let the calcium in. So, so once that calcium enters into that neuron, it becomes very excitatory, and it will eventually lead to cell death which is what you want, but, um, but you don't want it if you're 33 and health, you know, thinking you've got a long life in front of you. By the way, this slide doesn't show it, but the simplest amino acid that your body makes is called glycine, works right here too. So when you begin to think about glycine and its, its calming effect, which you probably, I, you know, hopefully you did, it's working on these NMD re, uh, receptors as well. Oh, boy. Um, so this is um, just another paper about the importance of magnesium and how it, uh, <clears throat> when you add magnesium into inflamed environments, it reduces the inflammation. That's cool. So remember, I was showing you the players of the NF cap of the tumor necrosis factor and interferon, those kinds of things. So when you take magnesium in, you're reducing those, and that's what this slide shows. Um, magnesium helps um, with the synaptic 
uh, protection in Alzheimer's. So actually, magnesium, as I've learned when I was doing research on this, um, I do research for these presentations, and so I, it's my fun pastime. I go into PubMed and, and get lost in rabbit holes. But this is um, one of the, magnesium is a just amazing neuroprotective. So, and this just says that. So this slide uh, is in your deck, you can refer to it, but this is all the benefits of magnesium. Um, diagnosis of neuroinflammation. I, so if there are specific testing and things that you can do for, for neurodegenerative, but I would not suggest you start there. I would suggest that you start with, hmm, is my patient inflamed? Not whether they're in stage three of Alzheimer's or they're in all this neurodegenerative, just are they inflamed? And um, it's much easier to look at these things. Um, I don't have the time, I mean, just to, to do justice to this slide alone would take several hours of lecture, and I don't want to belabor you, but um, these are all, for the most part, lab tests that you can get through your reference labs. But there are markers that would suggest that, you know, in certain levels, uh, an inflammatory process. So, so when we think about therapeutics, um, the gut becomes one of the primary target areas um, for therapeutic intervention. Uh, we can talk about this at breakout um, this afternoon when we do a case study, but know that with, um, this was taken from a Fazio uh, slide. The concept for me in, in gut restoration is to remove offender, offenders, um, replace enzymes and help digestion. Um, to repair the lining of the uh, intestine, and then to uh, re-inoculate. So there's, um, all of this can, in a sense, be done at the same time through a proper protocol. And of course, there's a dietary component of that as well. I won't go through the uh, endocannabinoid system because Dr. Hearns and John uh, did that well enough, and my little tidbits is, um, just gonna reinforce, but just know that as a therapeutic, the cabinoids are really important. Cinnamon has been shown to help uh, with the regulation of insulin as an insulin receptor enhancer, but interesting, it also helps in, in dissolving and breaking down uh, the amyloid beta precursor proteins. And know that the amyloid beta precursor proteins are a very healthy, normal, response to adverse environments in your body. You want those proteins made because they're kind of like these aberrant, sticky, gluey proteins that catch debris and oxidants and, and free radicals and viral and microbial waste. So, so you want that entanglement from those beta proteins. You just don't want them chronic. You don't want them in excess. So cinnamon is one of the things that helps reduce those. And then it, here's my friend curcumin. Uh, curcumin is one of those amazing um, herbs. It has, it has a database related to it that is thousands and thousands of studies big. And um, it is, and I'm not talking about turmeric, I'm talking about curcumin, the bioactive extract of turmeric. It has so many different um, protective uh, benefits that I would go, well, why, you know, between magnesium, essential fatty acids, and curcumin, why are we not all consuming these all the time? Maybe we should. Mm -hmm. And then there's a whole bunch of plant extracts that this group, I, you know, I'm the preacher speaking to the choir with this one. But um, again, but what I want to demonstrate for you is there's, there's studies papers, research, supporting from all kinds of different avenues what you're involved with here. So when we think about the big picture in reducing stress, um, I, I do not, um, I treat human beings. I don't treat ICD-10s. I don't treat diseases. I treat human beings. And so when I meet patients, and you'll see this, af this afternoon, because I deliberately chose a case that's complex, complicated, beyond belief, and, and you'll see how I handled what I did with it. But um, 
So I'm thinking, who's this person who's sitting in front of me? How did they come to be sitting in front of me? What is their life story? And what is out of balance? So how, what are those imbalances that they're sitting in front of me demonstrating? So it's not enough to just offer them a regimen of botanicals or plant-based um, nutrients. You have to help them make changes. You have to help them become aware of why and what has happened to them. So teaching them about what stress is, emotional traumas, mental traumas, um, as examples, um, how it's affecting their adrenals is um, important. I, I sit with patients usually for two hours in my first meeting so that I can get to know them this way. Um, and it's what's well, the way I practice. But so I teach, I teach patients stress management, and, um, and that involves you know, better sleep, um, stimulation. How many of you are familiar with some of the vagal tone exercises, like proper diaphragmatic breathing, gargling, singing, cold showers, gagging? Anything that you do to stimulate the vagus nerve um, helps balance that sympathetic, parasympathetic relation. And everyone that you see, including everyone in this room, is probably kind of in that sympathetic dominant state. If you watch news, God bless you. <laughs> if you watch news, you're in sympathetic nervous system response. I don't care where you are. If you watch news, you're, you're, you're deliberately setting, saying to yourself, stress me out. Okay? if you read the newspapers as well. So don't do that. Um, and then we look at um, fasting. I, I gave my patients a challenge for the uh, Lenten season to, to just do a, a, a news fast. Um, and some are doing it. Um, fasting or intermittent fasting diets are real important. Ketogenic diets and uh, reducing environment stress. Um, what, what's interesting for me, um, when I think about ketogenic diets and Paleolithic diets and intermittent fasting, why are they so valuable and, and effective in reducing inflammation? Uh, you don't have to answer that, it's rhetorical. It, it's, um, you're, what you're doing with those diets is you're removing, you're removing the garbage, primarily. You're reducing the inflammatory, stimulating foods like gluten, refined wheats, chemicals and on and on, right? So you reduce, so you're taking a lot of the environmental triggers and pulling them out of the diet, whether you know it or not. When you tell a patient, well, gee, I want you to do a paleolithic diet and just eat proteins and vegetables, that's a whole hell of a lot better than their french fries and hamburgers on a, on a weekly basis, right? So, um, so there's benefit that way. Keto, ketogenic diets are a little different. Um, they have um, a tremendous therapeutic value in, in getting patients away from insulin. When I think of insulin, and I'll be done in two minutes, Sarah, okay? Uh, I'm getting hungry too. So insulin, when you think of insulin, I am convinced that we were not designed to have high levels of insulin in our blood at any given time as a human species. It's a very... Um, it's a very destructive hormone when it's in excess. And so in little spurts and spurges, it's perfectly fine. But when you're constantly stimulating the pancreas to secrete all this insulin, it r runs ravages in the body in terms of um, damaging cell membranes and stimulating oxidative stress and, and in the whole inflammatory cascade. So one of the benefits of both the ketogenic diet and the paleolithic kind of orientation is that you're really reducing this insulin burden on your patients. And, and I think that that is one of the, um, it's one of the sidebar therapeutic benefits of it. Ketogenic diets are of the rage, of course. They're not easy to do. I don't recommend you put patients on them if they're stressed, because you know, putting a patient on a ketogenic diet when they're stressed is like literally having the foot on the gas and the brake as hard as you can at the same time. Why? Because cortisol stimulates insulin indirectly, okay? So does adrenaline. 
So you keep pushing and pushing it. And also, cortisol, if you remember, blocks your ability to synthesize fat for fuel, right? So, so, so if, if someone is stressed, don't put them on a ketogenic diet, please. Orient towards a paleo, a little, a little gentler. Um, these are order, uh, conditions associated with ketogenic and then intermittent fasting. The value of intermittent fasting is, is uh, for me, it's a concept of metabolic plasticity. And think about adaptation in life. Think about how we walk through our life, how we run through our life. We are constantly adapting to new environments. If you look at nature, everything in nature is constantly in this beautiful, beautiful ebb and flow of adaptation to changes in everything that we throw at it. We should be the same way in a, in a gentle way, in a controlled way. And by altering our caloric macronutrient values or levels um, periodically, it creates what I call metabolic plasticity, so that your, your systems are constantly in this gentle adaptation. And um, of course, intermittent and periodic fasting is one of the ways to do that. And you're also reducing, um, again, that insulin burden as well in the whole caloric value. We'll talk about an anti-inflammatory diet uh, this afternoon in case studies. I'll go through this in, in greater detail. Uh, and these are the foods that you would avoid. Um, and these are um, um, ideas about um, other ways to help get your patients to reduce inflammation. Um, and by the way, ask your patients, when you're with them, ask them this one simple question. What do you do for play? You could use the word recreation, but what do you do for play? And I guarantee you, very few of the responses will have, a, a, most of your patients will say, what's that? So um, it's real important. And um, again, exercise. This is in your slides. Do review this. It's really amazing about what exercise does for your brain. And these are the exercises for vagal tone. No, those are conditions related to it. This, these are the um, exercises. And if you need me to check your diaphragmatic breathing and breakouts, I will. And there's the beat slide. Thank you for your attention.